Welcome to the Five More Minutes podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It is February the 10th, and it is a full on winter in Vancouver. Um, my last podcast, I was updating you on my little like American adventure, and the snow apocalypse hit them first. And so I never made it to Wisconsin. So, Wisconsin, I'm sorry. I will get to you one day, I promise. But it was actually kind of nice because Paul and I were able to finish up the last recordings for our five more minutes. Um, and you're going to love them. They're going to be so good. And I also got to kind of come home a couple days early, which I really needed because, as you know, I've been kind of recovering from the cold um, and flu that lasted a gazillion years. So, yeah, that's the update on my life. Uh, what else? A week. One week to the move. We're moving next weekend. So maybe I'll do give you a little house tour. That would be fun, right? Um, I'm going to have I'm going to have a little podcasting room. I've decided that'll be good. That'll be really good. So um, if you have not seen the video for this month, it's called Compost Kate Saves the Earth. And it is about the infrastructure of inclusion. And it is a true story about my very, very good friend, Kate, and how she taught me to recycle. So if you haven't seen that sh- uh, that five more minutes, go take a look at it. Paul did a great job with the visuals and used little bit emojis, which um, Kate didn't think that it looked like her. But every time I showed it to anyone, they were like, hey, that's Kate. And I'm like, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that validation. So a little bit about Kate. Uh, Kate, Okay, so how do I know Kate? So Kate actually took over my job when I left my classroom and became a district helping teacher. And so she really kind of solidified the the vision and supported our kids to be included at the high school we were working at. And now she is a district helping teacher. And she has kind of a unique role. Uh, She supports uh, two programs, an elementary and a high school program that without them those kids wouldn't be at school and I think I get a lot of questions about this like what about kids who need scaffold to even get to the school like like they're not they're not we're not talking about classroom inclusion we're talking about school inclusion because often these are the kids that are um, excluded and isolated and and just not even there so she works with kids with complex multiple disabilities um, sometimes are negotiating some behavior self-interest or otherwise uh, maybe some mental health difficulties and there's been a, a lot of media around in British Columbia the tracking and isolation of isolation and exclusion of students in BC and I and I and I mentioned this in the interview with Kate but I I really don't believe that where this is happening is because people want to exclude people I just really think that people don't know what to do and so what I like about Kate's story is you know we're talking about infrastructure but what Kate does is she supports the people to support the kids. And, and I think, um, you know, it could be a program that's easily judged, but I know uh, something that I'm really learning, learning about inclusion is, you know, you can't just judge by looking. you got to have the conversations because what Kate's doing, I think, is she is bringing kids into communities um, who, you know what, it's not a lot of kids, and so they're easy, they're easy to ignore. Um, the kids that she works with, there's only 17 of them. And um, out of 22,000, so this is like 0.08% of the population of the school district. And so what she does is she kind of supports two programs that are school-based, which is really nice because these kids still have an opportunity and are enrolled in classrooms. And it kind of gives them a scaffold to kind of figure out like what, we don't know what to do, so let's figure out what to do. Let's figure out what they need. And it supports not only the kids to be successful, but it supports, um, there's additional training and, and um support for educational assistance to work with the kids and so they have they have a, another level of, of scaffolding there to, to work with them and so I think that it really aligns with my my criteria of inclusion is not just about place and time because it, it doesn't mean 100% of the places and time but for her and the kids she works with um, and her teams work with it's really about how do we increase places and time for kids to be with their like peers because without this scaffold I I don't know if they'd even be there and they haven't been so I think I think that I I don't believe that her that these programs and the programs that she supports are segregated but I think they're not segregated because Kate is there she has this vision um, about getting these kids included she's going to tell us a, a really great story about one of her kids that has had really great success 
Um, I know we've talked a lot about the criteria for inclusion also being about movement and always, you know, how are we getting better at this with what we have? And she's got an incredible team of educational assistants and uh, resource teachers and SLPs and OTs. And just, I think the district's done a really good job of, of providing the support and the infrastructure. And I think it's, it's a really good thing to pay attention to because I know that a lot of us are struggling right now about not knowing what to do and not knowing what supports are there. And of course, this takes funding and of course, this takes people. But I think it's a really nice example of what they used funding for and what they used people for in order to kind of meet some of those the hardest to reach kids um, in the district. So uh, take a listen. And I can't wait for you to meet Compost Kate. Happy February 10th, everybody. Um, So if you are in Vancouver, you know right now that everyone is snowed in. Now, just so that everyone is aware... It's not real snow day. It's not real snow, but outside outside of British Columbia, (laughs) this this is probably like spring weather. But in BC, this is like snowpocalypse, the world... It's shutting down. No one knows how to drive in this weather. Albertans are probably rolling their eyes. And the rest of Canada is really mad at BC because we've been laughing at them with our growing tulips. In the interior, that's only true to the lower mainland. That's a very good point. If you're wondering who I'm bantering with, my friends, this is the Compost Kate. Hi, Compost Kate. Hi. (laughs) Otherwise known as Kate Campbell, my very, very good friend, um, if you have watched the five more minutes video this month, you know that it is called Compost Kate Saves the Earth. And did you know that we that whole episode is actually created based on a real person? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a real person. You sure are. <laughs> and that story is true. It is definitely a true story. Like when when my cousin Paul and I were looking at all of the bitmojis of you, I was like, Kate has actually sat me down on the couch to say we need to talk. <laughs> Well, couch, chair, policy, documents for me to sign. I'm just saying, she was committed to making me change. Uh, Well, I did think it was important for your social (laughs) well-being in this province that you It's a good point. She's not wrong. She's not wrong. So the reason, the, the, the actual really exciting news about Kate Campbell is that not only is she a compost Kate, but she's also an inclusion Kate. Kate Campbell is a huge inclusion advocate, which is why we're very good friends because we can banter about recycling or inclusion. It's quite handy. Um, So why don't you introduce yourself to the world and tell us what your role is? Well, uh, I'm a teacher in the Richmond School District, and I have been a helping teacher for the district now for about three years. And so what does that mean? So what that means is that I work with school teams uh, to better support students, um, both uh, individuals and also class-wide That sounds very infrastructural. It is. (laughs) I'm just saying. Um, So so Kate, actually, I I know Kate because... um, So when I, how many years ago was that now? Five, six, seven years ago, I was working at a high school. 2008. 2008, that was 11 years ago? Yeah. Oh, man. So I was working at high school as their their teacher for students with cognitive and developmental disabilities, and I was just in the office, and I was feeling chipper that day, apparently. Yeah, I remember the exact moment that we met. Why don't you tell everyone how we met? Well, it was second semester 2008, which means that it was about <laughs> a week ago. She really has a good memory, people. Well, it was my first job. And Were I you was, TOC that day? No, I was, I was in my first contract. Oh, okay, got and it. And so I was picking up my key from my very first classroom, and a whirlwind of a person comes into the office. Which is normally not me. I don't know what she... I don't know why. Like, I must have been feeling really good that day. It was exactly Shelley Moore. And her toque was stuffed down over the over her ears, as it usually was back in the day. I used to wear toques to school. And her hair was licking out the sides. Because I didn't, I couldn't afford haircuts. This was like when I was a poor, starving st- like teacher student. We've all been there. Yep, yep. We were both um, kind of baby teachers at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I was picking up my key from my very first classroom ever. And she comes in and she's talking to the secretaries in the office who were amazing. And she turns and she looks at me and she goes, who you? Who are you? 
And I'm like, oh, I'm Kate Campbell. I'm picking up my key to my very first classroom. And we talk about I don't know what. And then she looks at me and she says, you say, you, I'm going to like you. And you left as fast as you came in. And yeah, maybe I was a whirlwind. The rest but look how good I am history. at predicting the future. Because, I mean, so Kate, like, stood in my wedding party and everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No. So, so then uh, when I was school-based, I joined the helping teacher team, which you are now. And then Kate took over my classroom and worked with the students that I had worked with at this school. And so, um, but you didn't start out in special education. You started out as? I was an art, art teacher. teacher. She's an incredible artist. And so um, I think that it was kind of neat because you got to be creative if you're going to be inclusive. And there's a lot of... of teachers that started out in the arts that are actually resource teachers, a lot of them. It makes sense. It's it's a logical connection for sure. So you, how long did you work at that high school for? I was there for on and off from that first contract, probably eight years. So I was pretty lucky because when I had to leave that school, because if you know the story um, that I tell is we worked really hard um, at inclusion at that school and it took us about seven years to get those kids into academic classes and so when you came over like you were such a perfect person because you followed out that vision like to a T and and I think really solidified it and it's still happening even though neither of us are there. Well I was I was very lucky because you broke a lot of ground that I was then able just to take and run with it and it's because we're a good team. Yeah. I know. High five. Although we fight like siblings I'm not gonna lie. Yeah she's she's kind of like my older brother. This is the nicest I've been to in weeks. (laughs) Okay, back to the podcast. Okay, so um, the reason why I have Kate on the show is because the, the the program that she runs specifically is kind of unique. And I know there's a lot of questions right now about what to do with kids who are the, like the outside of the outside pins, really, really hard to reach kids. And so the role that Kate's in now, you support like the less than 1% of the kids who wouldn't be in school. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that role? So part of my job is working with with the teachers that are in uh, a couple of different programs where, yes, it is it is the less than 1%. It is children that um, have ended, ended up in situations where inclusion hadn't been a positive experience for yeah. them um, because of a lot of reasons, often um, self-regulation and communication, big surprise, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, were things that were, were struggles. And so... Um, despite everyone's best efforts, despite yeah. everyone's A game, there was a lot of things that that needed to mm-hmm. be focused on that were environmental or mm-hmm. whatever it happened to be, where we just had to kind of bring just in, a bit. yeah, bring in the environment a little bit so that it was a mm-hmm. little bit more cozy for yeah. Well, and I think like there's there's a big conversation in British Columbia right now because. Um, there's a lot of tracking of exclusion and isolation. And, and the kids who are really um, being targeted for this are, are kids with complex needs, you know, um, especially often kids that have safety needs or self-interest behavior, things like that. And so, and I truly believe, like, I know that the districts and the teachers in this province, like, I really don't think, I've never met anyone in this province who purposely wants to exclude, exclude or isolate kids. But I think there's there's situations where people just don't know what to do. Like genuinely, they don't know what to do and they don't have the expertise or the knowledge to do it. Like there's a lot of turnover and we're, we're short staff and all of these things. And so what often ends up happening with the, Kate that, the kids that Kate works with is they often end up spending a lot of time at home or going to private centers that are totally segregated. So tell us about your program. So, so Richmond as a district wanted to... Um, do better for mm-hmm. our kids. Yeah. And so these these programs were kind of born where they are attached to schools. They have like a home school, community school base. Yes. And yeah. so so the students are getting are getting a extra level of support around mm-hmm. self regulation and communication. And what we're then able to do is to start to expand their world a little bit right. when they're ready for it so that they're they go then touch into classrooms and they start yeah. to to 
grow into the school a mm-hmm. little bit more so that when they're ready for it, it is available to them. And what I what I really love is that I think sometimes the breakdown for inclusion isn't at the kid level, it's at the staffing level. And so what I really see is the programs that you're in charge of, what they do is they're therapeutic to kids, but I think they also do a lot of scaffolding to support staff, to support kids who may not have the expertise to deal with like some of the complex needs that you deal with. And so um, in within within this program, because they're school-based, they have the opportunity to connect to classrooms, and they do. But I also see that there's a whole other layer of support for the EAs, the educational assistants in that program. There is additional speech and language support time, you know, and I, and I think that it's it's rich for a reason because we're working with the adults to support the kids rather than trying to fix the kids was what I really like about it. So a really neat thing about Kate is that she... Like her job is to support the adults, which I think is cool. Yes, um, being a, being a district helping teacher is a unique position to be in for me. In that, in that I'm not always directly working with kids. In fact, most of the time I'm very indirectly working with kids because I get to work with the adults that work with the kids mm-hmm. and that can be really exciting because well, there's also, a uh, sometimes a mentorship in it and yeah, sometimes yeah. it's just bouncing ideas well, off of each other. And a lot of times, and I really believe this, I really think that, you know, adults are sometimes like kids. You know what I mean? If they don't know how to do something, they're going to resist. They're going to push back. And so I see you as a whole level of support for adults to be able to work with kids that some maybe have never worked with before, right? Like the kids that you're working with are that 1% that are hard to get to and may not have, you know medical professionals working with them but they still deserve public education which i think is is pretty fantastic so it's an it's an interesting infrastructural kind of position for those like super hard to reach kids but my question now is like if you think about you know the facilities you know you've got some pretty cool things set up within that space that's in the school like what are some of the what are some of the what does the facility look like what are some supports that are within it well one of the things that are is important to to these programs is that is that again like we said they're they're connected to schools yeah um they have a lot of space for both individual learning spaces group activities um they they could be self-contained but they're not uh in that there's a whole other school waiting for the students well, and I think I'm glad actually you said that because if an onlooker walked into the school and saw it, they would think that it was self-contained, which totally brings me to my point that inclusion is not space and time. You know what I mean? It's the criteria that makes it inclusive. And so the reason why I'm getting you on this podcast is because it could very easily become a self-contained segregated program if it didn't have someone like you running it. You know, someone who has the inclusion vision is just like, this. these aren't self-contained doorways. This is simply a scaffold to get kids into classes in a way that they have the support that they need. Absolutely. Because inclusion looks different for everyone. Everybody's experience with Mm -hmm. inclusion is different. Everybody's social needs Mm -hmm. are different. Mm -hmm. And so, so just like that example, I love that example that you share about uh, the pep rally, how not all of the kids in your, in your program were going to go to the pep rally. You wanted them to go because that's what inclusion is, right, but right, right. but ultimately that wasn't what was going to work for everybody. But they had the difference is that they had the opportunity to go. It, exactly. Totally. So yeah, as yeah, soon yeah. as we start to limit opportunities for the kids, then right. they don't have anywhere to grow to. Right. And I think what I the more I do this work, the more I realize is that inclusion and I've said this before, but like inclusion is not just about place and time, but it's about increasing places with purpose over time. And Absolutely. So, and so what I see is that a lot of the kids that you're working with didn't have any place places where they were safe and so you've created a place where they're safe where we can figure out what they need so that we can in we can learn from that and then increase the places where they feel that purpose and that safety um okay so my question is what is tell us a success story well one of one of um the students that stands out for me is a is a boy we can call him adam who who at the time that he came to the team that he was working with, it it was um, a point, a place where he was in crisis in that he couldn't manage the amount of space that he had within the school, mm-hmm. and so so he was given he was given a 
a space that was a little bit because he remember because he was transitioning from elementary to high school he was which is like 10 times the size so just that transition in itself it just was a lot yes and so the the space ended up becoming um, a major issue in terms of the fact that he really didn't know what to do with all of that space and so we just kind of closed it in a little bit and worked on worked on him being comfortable in the space that he had. And as he became mm-hmm. more comfortable, those walls started to grow for right. him. And within about a year and a half, he was enrolled in a class within the school. Right. He was enrolled in a PE class, yeah. which was a strength for him. It didn't yeah. have to be PE, but that was a strength, strength. for him. And I think um, if you if you know, and, and maybe we can post some pictures of this, but this the space that Kate has to work with, it's, it's within a high school. There's an elementary version and a high school version. So it's within a high school, but within the classroom itself, there's some kind of like, different spaces that you can arrange and play with so that kids have some options in terms of how they can manage. So I, 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 what, I, what I'm really hearing is if we're talking about what are some infrastructural supports, it's space. You know what I mean? How do we work with space in a way where kids have choice, where adults have choice, where we're not secluding and isolating them, but some kids need spaces to go for different purposes, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, and so I like how you've kind of organized just the physical space of it, but also, you know, when you're dealing with space, you're also dealing with people. And so how do how do you navigate the people within the different spaces and how does the purpose purpose change within the spaces? So to see this little guy go from one space to now these multiple spaces where he's being successful, I, I think that's the goal. Yes. Well, and, and the goal, regardless of what kind of program our, our students are connected to, the, the, the goal for everyone should be that their, their world is getting a little bit bigger. Right, right, right. And so that, that, could be, that could be that they are attending a class, or it could be that they are doing work exploration, or it could be mm-hmm. that they are, are um, going on to some mm-hmm. kind of college mm-hmm. or university program. And so it, it looks different for all of our students. And I think, and I think what's important to realize is that just feeling safe and that you belong in one space, regardless of ability, isn't enough. Right. And so like, there's a lot of kids who don't even have disabilities and they don't feel safe in school. And there's a lot of kids who do or don't, and they have one space where they feel like they belong. But I think part of this is, is the kids that we work with often are really obvious examples of what all kids need, which is they need a home base. They need a home base. We need to learn what works for them, especially if there's no home base, and then start to increase that and help them find success in multiple spaces, Mm -hmm. right? And one of the the things that teachers um, that I've worked with have said to me in different contexts is, but Kate, what about inclusion when we're talking about the mm-hmm. fact that maybe their their time in, in class isn't as successful or as we long. want it to right, be, right, right, right. or isn't as long as right, we want right, it right. to be. Uh, and, and when they say, but Kate, what about inclusion? I actually, I kind of love it because it tells me that 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 is important to them, even mm-hmm. though they're not really sure how to navigate yeah. this and make it happen for yeah. their students. Well, and I think too, like there's a misunderstanding. I think that that inclusion means that kids have to be physically together all the time. Whereas this little guy, like inclusion for him was the movement, right? Like mm-hmm. it was increasing that time. And sometimes that's going to take some kids longer than others. But I think what makes it successful, a success, successful inclusive experience is that every day you and your team are working towards bringing those kids closer, closer to peers and spaces where they belong and where they have purpose. And so I think that's really important to recognize that it's going to take kids longer, but it's the criteria that's really making it inclusive, which is why I think your role is important because it would be very easy to just be like, we're just going to stay, we're just going to stay in the program all day because it's easier because it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And some of the kids probably many of the kids would be quite happy with that because mm-hmm. it's safe, it's comfortable, it's something mm-hmm. they're familiar with. But but if they're not given the opportunity to mm-hmm. have those uncomfortable stretches, yeah. uh, then then there isn't going to be growth. And- I read uh, this for my PhD, I read this article and they were saying how, you know, if you look at kind of self, self-contained self programs or special education in general, it's very predictable. It's very safe and it's very predictable. And one of the m- most important life skills that all of us can learn is how to navigate unpredictable environments. And so I think that if we're limiting our kids going out into the world 
I think that it's actually a huge disservice to them because having these guys that you're working with, having to navigate the diversity of those classes, even if it might not be as fast as other kids, is is pushing them in ways that I think is important. It's hard. It's hard work, but it's important for them, even though it takes them a long time. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you've, you've mentioned a few things, but I guess part of my question is, is what makes your program not a segregated one? I think intention is yeah. what is the is the difference is when a, when a program is held off site and there isn't opportunity then that's it we mm. are by limiting opportunity we are restricting wow. potential growth giving kids the space mm-hmm. that they need to grow and uh, the opportunity for it to be right there mm-hmm. is they might not be ready for it for a while. It could be yeah. it could be six months. It could be yeah. a year. It could be more than that before mm-hmm. students are ready to have those experiences. Mm-hmm. But then when they are ready for it, it's, it's there. there. You don't have to take a bus down the road. You don't have to. No, you don't no. even have to go to another building. It yeah. is You're there. It is there. there. It's waiting for them. Yeah. And then and then we're not the reason why the kids are limited mm-hmm. or our structures are not the reason why the kids are limited from meeting their right. their goals it's just when they're ready to do it so how do you know when a kid is ready it's calculated risk sometimes mm-hmm. D- dip our toe in the water and see if they're ready for mm-hmm. it and if they're not ready for it then we we try again try again later <laughs> and and so without those opportunities to do mm-hmm. that then our students aren't going to, they're never, we're never going to know. Mm-hmm. And so I guess if you think about your success, your little guy who's had a success story, you and your team, what, th- speaking because our theme is infrastructure, and I know that you know that I really believe that infrastructure isn't people. It's yes. what supports people to support people. <laughs> that didn't make any sense. What supports do pe- can people offer? to support kids. So if you think of your success story, what was some infrastructure that helped him be successful? We're always, we're always going to need the people. So yeah, that the people is people will always need the people, mm-hmm. but what do they do? Cause it's not just any people. No, we could have, we could have, uh, you could have 50 mm-hmm. people in your schools and it may not be effective, right? Like it's got to be something more than just like, what are the people doing? Like what, what is the school doing so that this kid could be successful? A lot of it ends up being, being the fact that within this structure, we have a lot of opportunity to time put into Mm -hmm. demystifications within the school. I think one thing that I've really enjoyed watching is the, it's almost like the freedom of innovation. Do you know what I mean? Like you, your schools that you're partnering with, they're very supportive and flexible of scheduling. They're very supportive and flexible of classroom connections. Like I think that there's there's a lot of places where that wouldn't be so easy. You know what I mean? But like the schools that I've seen you work with are very, very open to when those kids are ready, there's a place for them. You know? That's a very important piece is that is that Teachers feel like they have the support behind them yeah. so that they uh, can learn as they go. Not mm-hmm. everybody knows exactly what to do. In fact, most of, the, most of the time we're kind of figuring it out as we go because every mm-hmm. child is so unique and so yeah, different. Yeah. Um, but that but that nobody's on their own. Right. We're all kind of working on this together. It's something that we're all doing together. Mm-hmm. And for it to be successful Mm -hmm. there's space for you guys to work like the collaboration piece is huge yes yeah yeah Yeah. um i also like that like you you are not an enrolling teacher right so like you are available to work with adults because you don't have kids scheduled in into your day right and so you're able to travel and go back and forth and you know respond to crisis and need as it comes up like you and yourself I think are you know like the the kind of like that at the scaffold level of is there a person that can answer the questions when they come up and 
you know, be able to problem solve as, as things come up. Cause I see, I see that that is a place too. Cause if no one has a person they can call, it's going to be hard. Yeah. I, I do think that that is a really important piece of the success of the programs is that we have, we have our, uh, SLP, we have, um, ideally an OT, we have, uh, myself as a district teacher, we have teachers on site that are, that are the, the teachers that run the programs and amazing educational assistants. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so we have all of those pieces, but with those pieces, if we're not all working together and, and, uh, and have the time to do that collaborating together, then we're just a lot of people in a small space. So then here's a question for you. If you think about your role, what support do you need for for your kids to have success in inclusive settings? I the freedom of innovation is a really important piece for the success because we need to be able to we need to be able to think outside of the box and to to respond to what we feel our students need. Environment is a huge piece of that, right down to what kind of furniture is in this space, uh, what kind of lighting and what kind of what kind of sensory stimulation is in that space while we're we're working with students to get them to a, a place where they're able to take on the unpredictable stimuli that are going to be hitting them once they're out of that space. And so and so a lot of those things are things that we need to think about at the outset for the students to have a, a safe place to be while they're working on some really challenging things in their lives at this point in their life. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Well, Kate, thank you for, thank you for chatting with me today. Do you have any words of advice for the world? I always ask my people that. My advice is to find your goers, to find the people that are your, your passion people. As I've put it before, you were Mm -hmm. one of my early passion people. Actually, the reason why I went into this field entirely, because there was students in my class that I didn't know what I needed to do for them. And you kind of gave me direction and it set me on a different trajectory in my, in my profession. Uh, so find out, find who your goers are, or as you put it, previously your compost kates or whatever yeah. those whatever those <laughs> find your compost kates people are in your life and find those people and and then these challenges these things that we are faced with and the children are faced with become they don't they're not as daunting anymore it becomes a challenge mm-hmm. and we get excited yeah. and one tiny success turns into a lot of tiny successes mm-hmm. and and that's all we really need to fill that bucket and I'm gonna tell you I think that um I forgot what I was gonna say it was so good hmm. you can pause it and think about it yeah well how about I just tell you this I'm gonna tell you that um oh man it was so good well, okay. Well, anyways, do you want to help me? Do you want to help me respond to my story of the day? I do. Okay, so let's let's do a little let's do a little break, and then we'll come back and do our story of the day. And I'll try to remember what I was gonna say. All right. Okay, welcome back. So here I am with Kate. I still don't remember what I was going to tell you, but I was going to tell you like something I've learned from you because I like to tell my guests something I've learned from them. Okay, this is what I've learned from you. Other than how to recycle? Well, that's true. You did teach me how to recycle. (laughs) But um, if I think about, you know, like like if you ever have a chance to see any of Kate's work, I mean, it's not available or on display. Like this is something that you just kind of do because you love it, right? Or is it? The painting? Well, just like your art stuff. Oh, yeah. It's it's something that I do for me. Right. But I don't know. If you ever if you ever see Kate be like, hey, Kate, draw me a snowman. Like, she will draw you the most amazing snowman. Like, just anyway, take her up on the offer. But the point is, I think that your, your artistic perception of the world has completely allowed you to not just survive in this field, but thrive in this field. And, and if there's something that Leighton taught me, he's always said to me, I know I always talked about Leighton, but Leighton always said to me, he's like, you know when you've mentored someone and then they take it and run? Yeah. Because they have their own little twist of lime to it. Like, I look at you, and I know it's not the same because we're kind of, like, we're in the same, like, I'm not 
older than you and I'm not like we're friends. We're equals. This is coming out wrong. But the point is, <laughs> is that I see you taking the work that we started and just totally taking off with it in a way that's making it yours. And I think what I see in you is your ability to be flexible and artistic and kind of bring in that lens of um, creativity to figure out and problem solve that exactly how you say, like thinking outside the box, like you are an outside of the box thinker, which is I think exactly what the kids we work with need, because I think part of why they struggle is because we've been trying to fit them in too many boxes. So I think that you in yourself, like maybe you are an infrastructure, Kate, Kate is the infrastructure, not any other person. But no, but, you know, the infrastructural, it's the attitude of innovation. Okay? I, well, thank you. Um, I do think that it, I do think that we have to be open to being flexible so that we're yeah. responding to the students and not forcing them to respond to us. Uh, or just being like, or, you have to do this because this is what's been done. Yeah, or right, the right, system right. that's in place already. Well, this is actually a really good transition to my story of the day. So I get a lot of really great emails, and this one's from a parent. And so I, I'm interested to see what you think about this. Because I have a response, but I'd be interested to like we hear what you, if this was one of your parents, what would you say to them? Okay, ready? All right. So, hello, Shelly. I have two daughters. One is 13 and the other is 11. The 13-year-old has Down syndrome and the other one may be on the spectrum. Who knows? But aren't we all? <laughs> She's funny. Yeah. I like her. Okay. Regardless, all seemed more or less okay until the 13-year-old hit high school. It's a great school. Don't get me wrong. I do think this is a wonderful place. But from the start, I kind of feel like a bug on a windshield in a windstorm. I was like, wait, what? Where am I? She seems happy, but we've gone from the classroom to a special ed class, which I think is really sad. I live right across the school, uh, from the school, and I ride past and I see all of the special ed kids together in the field all the time. Um, I guess they're out there for gym class, but it's only them. For some reason, I thought, why are they separated from the other kids? It just doesn't sit right with me. I'm glad I'm not the only one who sees this as not only wrong, but also not productive, helpful, useful, or gainful. I think my daughter is happy, but I also am hopeful to see changes coming to our school system. Although sadly, I feel like by the time we get there, she'll be out of the system. Sadly, I also just feel the importance, uh, feel the importance is just put on the regular learners while others are looked upon, at least it feels like, as this is all we can do. This is the best we can do for them. Maybe my view is a, it's a tad skewed. I just think we can do better because we need to do better. Regardless, keep up the good work. I felt like our entire society has needed an overhaul in inclusiveness over the past 50 years I've been alive. Good work and thank you from a parent and really just another human being. So we see this a lot. This, I mean, this is not uncommon. No, it's, well, and it, it all depends on, on what their purpose is out there on the field yeah. if they're I, well here's okay here's I know I asked for your response but can I respond yes. and then I'll ask you yeah Kate's also way nicer than me so here's the thing so we just finished talking about these kids that maybe need time to transition the kids that we're talking about we did the calculations early 0.08 percent okay a very small number I think we group way more kids into that You know what I mean? Like, unless there is, like, some steaming fire crisis, I just don't understand why kids are grouped together on a field for phys ed. Well, if it's for phys ed, then I agree. That is one of the more accessible Phys ed is so accessible. Yeah. You just have to move. Yeah. Um, I think think what, as as a parent, um, what I would suggest is, talk to the school team, talk to the administrator and see what other options there are that they're currently prepared to, mm-hmm. to do. Um, you if, know what often they'll say to me? Often I tell this story, they'll say, well, if they go to phys ed, then they won't get their EA. I'm... You know what we did at the school? We're like, fine, we'll send two. <laughs> We'll be sneaky about it. But I mean, it is a thing because you can't be in more than one place at one time. And so it becomes like this structural shift to say either kids are going to be included in phys ed or they're not because it's hard to run both. Like a segregated and an inclusive phys ed class. When, when the students are in class together and there is 
differentiation of instruction in yeah, place, yeah. then it should it should be something that is easier for for the educators, the mm-hmm. teachers and the EAs to be able to to work with a group that has mm-hmm. diverse needs, whether they're physical or uh, cognitive mm-hmm. needs. And that is something that with with prep and consultation time, the teams could work together. Mm-hmm. Um, as a parent, that is outside of what you would be able to do. But I would I would start mm-hmm. by having those those difficult conversations, yeah. having those uncomfortable conversations well, with your school. And if you think about like if our if our goal is infrastructure, what would be the infrastructure that, that school would need to be able to open up their phys ed classes to be more inclusive? Because maybe the class maybe the phys ed teachers don't know what to do. So like you say, like that consultation would be really important then, right? Mm-hmm. And and there are uh, people at the district level that may have, it may be their their job to come mm-hmm. in and support that, to That's make a really that good more point because, accessible. Because when I first started working, I didn't even know, like sometimes it was just a communication thing of who's out there who can support me, like, you know, and I just didn't know that the people were available. So sometimes it's helpful just to kind of look and see, like, who has, because you did mention it, like, that idea of multiple expertise. Like, if I don't have an expertise in this area, who in my community does? Mm-hmm. And I am I am far from a phys ed expert. Um, it is not, it mm-hmm. is not my background whatsoever. Yeah. I can't throw a ball in a straight Path. It's true, she can't. Uh, but I do know how to find access points for other kids. And yeah. so uh, so just bringing together all mm. your different people, uh, we all bring something to the table. Yeah. And as I think it's Leighton yeah. said, you, you, we're, none of us are as good alone as we are together. And Maybe we should rename this podcast, What Would Leighton Do? <laughs> what Would Leighton Do? <laughs> Because I talk about it every podcast episode, right? Yeah. Oh, I think man. I'm pretty sure that I suggested you have a bracelet that would said WWLD. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> I just get that tattooed on my body. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kate. I think uh, this is a really real issue. And I think, you know what? I think actually phys ed is a really great place to start because I think phys ed could be more inclusive to a lot of kids, not just kids with disabilities. I oh, mean, for me, especially. Who's going to do the beep test? Why? You don't need to do the beep test. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, exactly. It's probably good. That means, you know, it was like... Your phys ed class was more evolved than mine. I don't know about that. <laughs> Did you ever have to do the Kelper test? We had to Calpers? do it. Oh, is that when they pinch your tummy? They pinch your fat. I do remember very, very vividly the 12-minute run. Like, why? Did you know that there's no goal in the curriculum that says you have to play dodgeball? You would never know. Well, if you can dodge a ball, you can dodge a wrench. No, it's the other way around. You can dodge a what? If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. A wrench? It's why a would you dodge wrenches? We're going to cut that part. <laughs> Okay, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Let's say bye to the world. Bye, Bye, everybody. everybody. Isn't she fantastic? I mean, I know I pick on her and I like treat her like a little brother, but she's great. I'll keep her around. She's doing incredible work. Um, A few takeaways today. Okay, so cue dreamy music. So, um, I know I mentioned this many times, but I think it's important. Um, a really big takeaway I get from my conversation with Compost Kate is really talking about we have to look at inclusion as, inclusion as more than just place and time. And because some kids are going to need more time than others um, to, to have that sense of safety and belonging. And so she's really looking at how do we increase places. But this is not just dropping kids in. This is purposeful for them. It's supportive for the classroom, the team, the teacher. Um, she talks about demystification so that the classrooms know who these kids are so that the teachers know so that the schools know how to support this kid because um, I've seen so many quotes like it's not about changing the kid it's about changing the environment and I think that's exactly what Kate's doing is how do we get the environment and the classrooms ready for these kids that are hard to get to and, and it ta- it's going to take longer and I think that's okay uh, she also mentioned if we're talking infrastructure the importance of prep and time and consultation co-planning meeting time collaboration um, that is what people need, that, that, I, that opportunity for multiple expertise to come together. I always, like, some of my favorite people in the world are SLPs, speech and language pathologists, because they, like, honestly, they're like the Jesus of education. I think I said that about Layton, too. Layton and SLPs, they know everything. And if I were in charge of things, I would have every classroom have a projector, an FM system, and an SLP. They're just phenomenal. Uh, they know everything. Uh, they, they, they can help um, any kid. And so if you know one, call one, um, get, their, get, their, get their perspective because 
they have a lot of information in their in their head to give um another thing that kate brought up which i'm really really discovering in my research is is the importance um, of attitude and belief and i'm realizing that if, if the people you're working with whether it's classroom teachers or educational assistants if they don't believe that these kids belong that's almost the the biggest barrier and so if we're talking about infrastructure you know, finding the people that believe and, and understand the importance of these kids being a part of these communities. Um, and because it, it is a human right, absolutely, but they have contributions too. And I think that the biggest success I see is when people believe. And I, and I know that is about a person and I know you can't change that, but I think the more that we can, can really find those people that, that really get this, the goers as Kate called them, I think it, it's, it's one of the most powerful structural supports. Uh, the other thing that Kate said that I really, really loved is that uh, she said that no one can do this alone, and I totally, I totally agree. Inclusion is not an I model. Uh, you, you can't do this by yourself. And I tried to in the past, and it didn't go well. Uh, you need people around you because um, not there's no one I've ever met who knows everything, but collectively we kn we know enough. And and Faye said that in a podcast a couple weeks ago. The other thing that I really liked, and I and I wonder what this would look like outside of kind of working with kids with complex disabilities, but you know the the infrastructural support of the ability to play with space and the environment and the context that kids are in, and and this is not just the kids that she works with, but imagine if at a school level or a district level, we gave ourselves more time, um, not time, but like like a, the flexibility to play. Like how can we? How can we figure out how to break down some of these like really, really colonialized and industrialized, you know, actual physical walls um, that have been barriers for a lot of collaboration between kids and teachers? I was in a school on the island a few weeks ago, and they created a classroom that fits 120 kids, um, so that kids could, because kids, so that multiple classes could work together with multiple teachers. And I thought that was such a great, a, a great way to play with space. And and they were doing one inquiry project where they built these roller coasters, and they had the space to do it. And so Kate is doing that on a micro level, but I don't think it's limited just to her kids. I think if if we kind of gave ourselves permission to play a little bit more with the with the environment and the space I think that some really really cool inclusive things could happen um, the story at the end um, oh I find it so sad when kids are excluded from phys ed because I think phys ed is one of the most accessible uh, classes and communities that kids can be involved in um, and I think if it's if it's not inclusive it's it's not just not inclusive for kids with disabilities I think a lot of kids are struggling with phys ed right now and so if we kind of just take a step back and be like what is the goal of this and it is healthy living and it is you know getting to know what your body needs and it's not about the beep test and I think that if we was the more that we kind of realize what those goals are the more we're going to find um, entry points for for all kids not just kids with disabilities so if you're out there and you're listening to this and if you want a place to start start with phys ed and if you're a phys ed teacher listening to this this don't do the beep test anymore or the calipers um, and maybe go down to those wings and, and, and pull those kids down and invite them to your classroom because they have they have they have just as right to be there and be healthy as anyone and um, and I think it's a great place to start so oh that's it thank you for joining us I've lost track of the numbers eight nine seven it's February 10th podcast. Um, so we have a video strategy coming up in one week. And then I have uh, Jennifer Cates, who's going to join us and talk about infrastructure at a district and a school level, which will um, align really nicely to what Kate offered today in terms of her infrastructures that support her kids. So thank you so much for listening and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Five More Minutes is produced by Shelley Moore and Paul Madsen. You can find five more minutes on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, Instagram, Spotify, Twitter, and on fivemoreminutes.com. See you next time. <laughs> Thanks, Kate.